Welcome and good morning to another Family Bible Hour here on uh, the last Sunday of January. So we welcome everybody with us um, and I hope that you are having a great week and a great weekend. This weekend marks the fourth segment in our series that Randy's been taking us through, Isaiah, the Gospel according to Isaiah. And this week Randy's going to look at uh, verses 7 to 9. And if you looked at his update this week, he told us that this is going to be on the topic of the dramatic silence of the suffering servant. Again, Isaiah 53, verses 7 to 9. So get your Bibles ready. Randy will be coming to us in just a short few minutes. Got a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, again, if you've missed any of our sermons and this series that has kicked off 2021, you can always check on our Bethel Facebook page our website, and also our YouTube channel. So make sure you know how to access those. Currently, uh, our prayer meetings are via Zoom. Wednesday at 7 p.m. is for the ladies, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. for the men. And if you haven't joined us or would like to and need the links, please co uh, contact Randy or Pat for those. Again, we remind you of our Bethel annual meeting and save the date for the evening of Saturday, February the 20th. Uh, restrictions pending and more information will follow. I'd ask that you would pray uh, along with us for the LeBlanc family, for Mavis, for Emma and Kayla in the passing of Mike uh, this past Friday night. Uh, a dear friend of course to all three of them and to many others, a father to the girls and Mavis's dear husband. So please pray for the family in the coming days. Good morning. Our reading is again from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather uh, over YouTube and over technology this weekend, we thank you that we can be fed from your word, from the truth of your word. And as we have been enjoying Isaiah, we are uh, looking forward to digging into verses 7 to 9 uh, today to understand the silence of your son, the suffering servant, uh, prophesied so many years before his coming to earth. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, Randy's ministry, for his willingness and his uh, heart to study, 
And uh, we pray for him, Father, this morning as he guides us through this passage. We also pray, Father, for all of the um, uh, ongoings at Bethel, for our church family, for our leadership, the elders and the deacons. Uh, we think of our, our missionaries, the, the lots away from us in PNG, doing their work there. And we thank you, Father, that um, even though we are disconnected in this way, there are so many things going on. I think of, of Awana with some online uh, content that is being produced for the Cubbies. Uh, in, th in a big thanks to the um, foresight for that piece. And so, Father, we, we continue to live out Ephesians 4.16 as we work together in love and in unity for the cause of the gospel. We also, Father, with uh, heavy hearts and sad hearts, uh, bring before you the LeBlanc family for Mavis and for Emma and for Kayla in the passing of Mike. Father, we just pray that you would surround them and comfort them in the days ahead and uh, that we would be a comfort as a church family to them and uh, show our love and care. And so we, we lift this, that family up to you uh, this morning. Father, as Randy comes to us, we ask that you would guide us again in your word. Thank you for uh, what we're going to hear and we look forward to being taught again in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Good morning, Bethel, and welcome back to the look at Isaiah 53 under the title, The Gospel According to Isaiah 53. This is our fourth of five segments. Our final one will be next Sunday. And today, our plan is to look at verses 7, 8, and 9. If you've got your Bible open, that's where we'll look at the text. Just before we do, think about the word title. In our culture, a title is usually the name of something. The name of a book, or a song, or a movie, or a play. But titles can also be attached to people's names, right? A title can suggest an office, or a rank, a profession, even a hereditary privilege. Dr. John Stackhouse was an elder in this church back in the 1970s. Sir Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain in the Second World War. We don't use titles a lot in our culture here, but nicknames are much more common. The Great One had a birthday recently. One of the quarterbacks in the Super Bowl next weekend has been referred to as the GOAT. And that's not a pejorative term. That's an, an acronym meaning that he's the greatest of all time. That's his nickname. I mention that because Jesus of Nazareth was the most titled person. He had the most titles and nicknames of any person in all of human history. One time there was a, an academic, a scholar, who was invited to a commencement address for a prestigious Christian school. And he was to give the commencement address. And when he came, people expected something deep, something theological, something weighty. And rather what he did is he walked up to the lectern when it was his turn to speak, and for 25 minutes, he simply listed one after the other names and titles of Christ. The Word, the Son of God, the Great Shepherd, the Son of Man, Wonderful Counselor, the Truth, the Suffering Servant, the Lamb of God. That last title is one that was assigned to the Lord Jesus by John the Baptist. We've talked before about John the Baptist. He was a prophet who seemed in some ways to be in a time warp because the prophets had stopped their ministry 400 years before the time of Christ. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene and people recognize by his unique character, here is another prophet. God is no longer silent. God is again speaking. When John the Baptist encountered the Lord Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the Gospel accounts, John is the only one to use that title of the Lord Jesus. And he only did so twice. He didn't even explain what it meant, and he didn't have to, because to Jewish ears, the Lamb of God pictured Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, as being a sacrifice. The lamb part is analogy. Lambs were typically 
slaughtered. And the big idea of this text that we're looking at today in verses 7, 8, and 9 is that the Lord Jesus submitted willingly to the cross as the silent, suffering servant. Take a look with me at verse 7. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. He, speaking of the suffering servant, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. This is a detailed, thoroughly precise prediction of the specifics of the life of Christ and the death of Jesus. When we're thinking about who is the suffering servant, which is the question that has been debated intensely around this text, it's obviously pointing to Jesus of Nazareth 700 years after Isaiah predicted this. And if we were to take the Isaiah 53 template and lay it over the narrative of the life of Christ, the match is precise and perfect. It's interesting that in this entire servant song of Isaiah 53, stretching back to the last verses of Isaiah 52, that the suffering servant, the Messiah, doesn't speak a word. His father speaks. The nation of Israel speaks. Isaiah the prophet speaks. But it points ahead to this highly unusual feature of the arrest and trial of Christ that he was always pictured as having calm silence and a refusal to resist. And it's so unusual for a person in his situation before these authorities charging him with a capital offense, it's so unusual that all four gospel writers make specific note of it. Let me give you a few examples. In Mark chapter 15, the Jewish chief priests were accusing Jesus of many things, Mark says. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. In Luke 23, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, Luke tells us. But Jesus made no answer. And in John 19, the Jews had accused Jesus of claiming to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard that, the text says Pilate was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. But otherwise, through his trial, Jesus was characterized as being silent. And that's why verse 7 says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that, is, that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Do you remember last week we made the point that I, I wondered whether the Lord had created sheep for the purpose of spiritual analogy. Sheep are pretty unique, different animals. In verse 6 we studied, we all like sheep have gone astray. And at that point, Isaiah was talking about the wayward, foolish, aimless independence of people when it comes to recognizing God's authority and God's sovereignty, and he compared us to sheep in a negative way. Here in verse 7, the servant of the Lord is compared to sheep in a positive way because it, he's demonstrating quiet, he's demonstrating a passive response to the oppression that has been brought upon him. And so, when you're talking about things that you don't know much about, you consult with people who are experts. And my consultations on the issue of sheep went to Mike and Sylvia. And Sylvia told me that when you're shearing sheep, even if you nick them, even if the, the razor comes in and nicks their skin, typically they won't protest. Mike talked before about a time in our Bible study group, about a time when he was slaughtering sheep. And he had his arm around the sheep, around the sheep's neck, 
and they, they were almost nose to nose at this point. Mike knew what he was going to do, and those big sheep eyes were looking at him trustingly as he's about to slip the throat of the sheep. They're very unique that way. But their sheep are a great analogy for the Lord Jesus because one of the characteristics of his crucifixion, of the trial, the torture, the crucifixion, was that there was no protest, no resistance, no complaint. His antagonists, particularly Pilate and Herod, were shocked. They were surprised. They were nervous. They were disquieted by that. They had never seen anybody go through what he had gone through without protesting vehemently. But he had nothing more to say. He had already said it in his teaching, in his miracles, and in his life. This was not a, a good effort gone bad, as some liberal commentators have suggested. This was the eternal plan of the triune God, and the suffering servant was carrying it out. And so, verse 8 says, by oppression, there's that word again, both in verse 7 and in verse 8 in this version of the Bible and in many, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. The arrest and the trial of the Lord Jesus were characterized by physical abuse, by his Jewish antagonists, and also by the soldiers. Oppression is talking about the fact that the checks and balances of judicial objectivity were brushed aside. They were ignored in their rush to get the Lord Jesus to the cross. Herod and Pilate recognized his innocence because five times he was proclaimed to be, he was declared to be innocent. But the Jews had this deeply rooted hated hatred for the Lord Jesus. Even though they had a highly developed system of justice, the trial of the Lord Jesus was notable because judicial standards of fairness and objectivity were shattered. They were annihilated. This was a mockery of a trial. Many rules of judicial protocol were brushed aside. They only wanted to get the Lord Jesus hung on the cross. Let me give you some examples as we talk about the oppression of the Lord Jesus in this text. First, Jesus was arraigned. He was forced to appear before a criminal court to answer charges before he had even been accused of a crime. That was a breach of judicial protocol. In fact, they had determined his guilt and his punishment even before his trial. There was no concern for truth or righteousness or justice. Secondly, the high court illegally convened during the trial of the Lord Jesus at night to try a man who had not yet been formally charged. It was during one of the holiest days of the year. And yet, that breach of judicial protocol was carried out in the rush to have him crucified. Then, when a capital punishment, when, when a capital crime was being charged and capital punishment was being considered, it was the law that the trial was to be held publicly at the temple. But the trial of the Lord Jesus was in private at the high priest's residence. And then, after paying Judas to betray him, the court was prompting false witnesses to obtain testimony to convict the Lord Jesus. False witnesses willing to perjure themselves, and they couldn't even agree on their testimony. Then the unrestrained frustration and hatred of the Jewish elite was evident. Matthew's Gospel tells us that members of the court struck him and spit in his face. In most cultures, including Jewish culture, to spit in the face of somebody was the supreme insult. And the Jewish law provided that there were rights and protections for the accused. They were ignored in the trial of the Lord Jesus. And in capital cases, when a judgment was rendered and execution was decided upon, it could not happen on the same day as the trial. That was the law. And because Friday was a holy day and Saturday was a Sabbath, the soonest they could have crucified the Lord Jesus at law was on Sunday. The greatest miscarriage in all of human history was unfolding. And through the night on that holiday weekend, under the cover of darkness, at the privacy of the residence of the high priest, the determination was to convict Jesus and to crucify him on Good Friday. But the eternal plan of the triune God was being carried out. 
that the Lamb of God would be crucified on Passover. And so Jesus remained majestically silent. He was unwilling to dignify the process by speaking. His silence was a silence of innocence and control, of dignity, of integrity, and of trust in his Father. Continuing with verse 8, And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, Isaiah says. When he talks about as for his generation, Isaiah is pointing ahead to the fact that the suffering servant would live at a time when his peers, his own generation, would reject him. They would reject his identity, they would reject his mission, and they would discard him as being their substitute. And when Isaiah says he was cut off, the word that he uses there is unique. There are 420,000 Hebrew words in the Old Testament. This word appears only 13 times. So it's quite unique, quite unusual, and also very graphic. The term for cut off means to cut down, to destroy, to eliminate, to separate, to exclude. The suffering servant would not only suffer, Isaiah said, but he would be cut off and that he would be killed dramatically, cut off out of the land of the living. Why? Well, Isaiah says he was stricken for the transgression of my people. That reminds us of a concept we looked at last week. We called it penal substitutionary atonement. Penal has to do with being penalized. It has to do with being punished with pain. We talked about that atonement is to atone or make right, to make restitution for something. And the substitute is the gospel. Christ in my place. He, if you think back to last week, he was the scapegoat, carrying the sins of the people out into the darkness, carrying them away from the people forever. You and I live, who otherwise should have died, because the suffering servant died, who otherwise should have lived. Verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked. The valley of Gehenna, also called the valley of Hinnom, is a narrow gorge curving along the southwest corner of the city of Jerusalem. It was the scene of idolatrous worship during Israel's lowest point, during the, the Jewish, final Jewish kings of Judah. They actually sacrificed their children in fires in the Valley of Gehenna. And because it had such a negative, unthinkable history, the people of Jerusalem turned it into a refuge dump, a garbage dump. There was a constant fire there. The fire would never go out. It was constantly burning up the garbage. And it became a symbol for, it became synonymous with the concept of hell. Gehenna was where the corpses of criminals were taken, those who were wicked, those who were punished by the state, who were executed by the Roman government, were thrown onto the pile of garbage at Gehenna after execution. That's what happened to people who were executed. That was the final indignity to them. And humanly speaking, it was the intention of the Jewish elite and the intention of the Roman soldiers that the body of Jesus would be discarded in Gehenna, like most of the other um, criminals were, most of the other victims of crucifixion, and he would be left there to rot as food for the vultures. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. How could that be? Well, the great irony of the death of the Lord Jesus and of his burial is that he was intended to go to Gehenna, but he didn't. He went to exactly the opposite. The great irony is that the Sanhedrin that had convicted him, the Sanhedrin was the Jewish ruling council. Seventy powerful, wealthy Jewish men plus the high priest, 70 plus one, made up that ruling council. And according to the gospel record, Joseph of Arimathea, 
a powerful and wealthy and righteous man who was a Sanhedrin member, he had enough authority and status that he would have access to Pilate and he would have favor with Pilate. He marched into Pilate and he requested the body of the Lord Jesus. And contrary to the wishes of the Jewish elite, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, the others, the body of Christ was granted to Pilate. And together with Nicodemus, who was also a Sanhedrin member, he was buried. The picture on your screen shows that. Nicodemus had brought expensive burial spices, 75 pounds worth of spices. And the Lord Jesus was wrapped and he was quickly buried in an expensive tomb in a beautiful garden. The promised exaltation had begun. He was buried among the rich in his death. Joseph and Nicodemus probably had undertaken career-ending moves that day by this kindness extended to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus received a rich man's burial with a rich man in his death. It was maybe the only thing of privilege, the only thing of prosperity, the only thing of luxury that he ever experienced. And it was after his death. No more humiliation. He was resurrected, he was honored, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Do you remember we talked about that in our first week, back in Isaiah 52, verse 13? He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted, as he was elevated to the right hand of the Father in heaven. But it's a reminder that the silent, the, the silent serv servant suffered greatly. He suffered unjustly. Because the Lord Jesus suffered not for his own sin, he suffered for the sins of others. That was the eternal plan. Verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Christ in my place. Let's conclude this morning with two takeaways. The first is theological, the second is practical. Here's the first one, the theological one. Why is it that the gospel is hated and is therefore ignored and disbelieved? Because the gospel is hated, ignored, and disbelieved by Jewish people and by Gentile people. 700 years before Christ, Isaiah so meticulously and accurately completely and compellingly predicted about his life the details of his trial and of his death right here in this text. That it's such an amazing thing. As I said before, when you take the template of Isaiah 53 and lay it over the historical narrative of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, it's a perfect fit. So why don't people know about it? Why don't people embrace it? Why don't people believe it? Walter Kaiser is a theologian, and of Isaiah 53, he says, it is the most complete statement of the design, purpose, and significance of the death and resurrection of the servant, who in its fulfillment clearly is Yeshua. That's the Jewish name, the Hebrew name, Jesus. There's no question as to who Isaiah 53 is about. There's no question as to the identity of the silent, suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Chosen People Ministries. We've talked about them before. They're an organization that shares the gospel of Christ with Jewish people, by Jewish people, Jewish people sharing with other Jewish people. And in 2010, they did a significant blitz in New York City. As we mentioned before, New York City has the largest Jewish population anywhere in the world outside of Israel. And in that 2010 uh, media blitz, they used popular websites, they used enormous billboards, Times Squares, uh, both sides of the Lincoln Tunnel, uh, in buses, in subway cars, in phone booths, in bus shelters. They mailed 75,000 postcards to Jewish addresses in New York City. And the purpose of the campaign was to offer a book about Isaiah 53 or to direct people to their website to learn about the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, part of the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. 
At that time, they did a survey of Jewish people's Bible knowledge. And they found this. When they asked Jewish people about Moses and the Exodus, about 82% of people had at least some familiarity with that character and that story. And a similar amount, about 80% of people knew who Queen Esther was from Purim. And about the same amount knew about King David. But when it came to Isaiah 53, it was the reverse. 72% of Jews surveyed in this survey had little or no familiarity with Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant. This powerfully evocative poem has been ignored and disbelieved by Jewish people for centuries. And it's true today. An example of that is Dr. Mitch Glazer. That's his picture on the screen. He talks about the fact that he, as a Jewish man, was born seven years after the Holocaust in what he described as a fairly typical Jewish home. He went to Hebrew school to study for his bar mitzvah. He learned to read the Torah, the five books of Moses, in Hebrew. His family celebrated major Jewish holidays. He went to Jewish summer camps. In fact, he had no non-Jewish friends, no Gentile friends, until he was in high school. And he says that his parents, he didn't think his parents ever had non Jewish friends. They lived in a Jewish neighborhood and their friends were all Jewish. Dr. Glazer dropped out of college when he was a, just really more than a teenager, went to San Francisco with some other Jewish friends, and to his shock, some of his Jewish friends became followers of Christ, became followers of Jesus, followers of Yeshua. Through a series of dramatic events, he ended up finding a New Testament, which he saw as an answer to a secret prayer that he had made. And he began to read the New Testament. And through reading the New Testament, he came to faith in Christ. He became a Christ follower. He returned home to New York, and he told his parents that as a Jewish man, he was now a follower of Christ, and they evicted him from his home, from their home. They said he was no longer welcome there. And on the last night before he left from home the next day, he asked his mother if he could read Isaiah 53 to her because he was certain that when she heard Isaiah 53, the identity of Jesus was so crystal clear in the Jewish prophecy from seven centuries before Christ, he was sure that she would repent and embrace Christ. As he began to read the text, the text that uh, Ken read to us earlier, she fell asleep. So he awakened her, and he continued reading until he had finished. At the end of the reading, at the conclusion, she said to him one thing. I told you not to read the New Testament to me. He said, but mom, this isn't the New Testament. This is from our own Bible. This is from our own prophet Isaiah. This has been in our Bible for centuries before Christ was born. And his conclusion was this. Isaiah 53 seemed to point so clearly to Jesus, he said, that I assumed that my Hebrew teachers and rabbi had been intentionally ignoring it. There had been an Isaiah 53 cover-up. And there continues to be to this day. Among Jewish people, among Gentile people. The Bible is ignored, and Isaiah 53 is ignored, and it's disbelieved because the gospel is hated. That's the natural inclination of natural people. Number two, our final takeaway is a practical one. With Christ as our example. We live in an era of the assertion of personal rights, of my entitlement. I should never have to apologize for being me. I should never have to apologize for expressing myself, we hear. I should never have to regret even if I renege on commitments because really I have a right to be happy, whatever that takes. I've got swagger, I'm going to show it, and everybody's going to hear it. We hear those kinds of things all the time. We live in an era of masks, and isolation, 
and restrictions on our personal freedom. And many of us have stood up and said, that's not fair. In fact, some of us say that to almost everybody who will listen. I'm not happy about what's going on either. None of us are. But it's easy for us to assume the role of being victims, of being the martyr, of being the aggrieved party. Now, there are clearly times when it is appropriate for us to speak out. That's the example of Christ. But there are also times when it's not appropriate to speak out so much that we become characterized by this issue. And some of us, I think, frankly, are characterized by protest, by complaint, by victimization. The most important objective for the follower of Christ is the issue of sanctification. That simply means becoming more like Christ, becoming more Christ-like. And the example of the Lord Jesus in this text is one of silent, passive, calm, trusting faith, even in the face of attack. May 2020 be a year when his example, when his teaching, when his spirit empower you and me to be more like him, even in the current circumstances. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we work our way through Isaiah 53, my prayer is that more and more we would develop a capacity to be like Christ and to treasure Christ. For those of us who are followers of Christ, our primary objective needs to be to be more like Him. And for those, Lord, who have not yet engaged in a relationship with you through the, your Son, the Lord Jesus, may this text today challenge them to think very carefully about who He is, about what Isaiah predicted about Him, and how the Lord Jesus is the only one who can be identified with this text. This is purely amazing. This must be the work of Almighty God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning.